Thank you, Tyler, for that good song. Appreciate the band and all the work they put in. I hope you've enjoyed the music and the choir, all that has gone on today. Open your Bibles, if you would, to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. The passage begins with the word, therefore. One of the basics of Bible interpretation is when you see the word, therefore, you need to look back and find out what the therefore is there for. Okay? Why it's there. <clears throat> this one refers to the previous 11 chapters. Paul is saying, <clears throat> because of what I've just discussed back in, the first, in all these 11 chapters, of course, he wrote it, it was just a letter, it wasn't divided into chapters, but listen to what I'm trying to say. Uh, because of what I have just discussed in the first part of this letter, therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters. Now, the book of Romans is absolutely filled with deep doctrinal truths. There, it discusses the doctrine of sin and the doctrine of salvation and the doctrine of sanctification and the doctrine of God's sovereignty and the doctrine of Christian service. All of these things are packed into this one huge theological essay. These Roman people have been justified by faith, according to chapter 5 and verse 1. They have been set free from sin, according to chapter 6, verse 18. They have been released from the law, according to uh, chapter 7, verse 6. And they have been made alive, made alive in Christ, according to chapter 8, verse 10. And listen, it is all about Christ. The, the only human contribution in all of this equation is our faith. He does everything else. It is His grace. It is His mercy. It is His love that has provided all of these great, incredible spiritual blessings that we enjoy. And that the people of uh, the Roman believers were enjoying at the time. So that brings us to our passage and let me share with you, just uh, my outline is, is kind of awkward, okay? But just go along with it. The first thing he talks about in verses 1 and 2 are, uh, is the sacrifice that transforms our lives. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what is God's will. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Here in chapter 12, Paul sort of shifts gears in the, in the middle of his letter. He has been writing about these great doctrinal themes, and now he switches from doctrinal things to more practical things. Well, how do you live this out? How do you do what I've just been talking about in the previous chapters? And living out this new relationship with Christ, how do we go about it? And he challenges the believers in Rome to... Go beyond just a profession of faith. Just knowing that I am saved and I have Jesus in my heart. Let's go beyond that and start conforming to who Jesus is. To start becoming like He is and start renewing our minds in God's Word. This inner transformation that has already taken place. Remember, this book is written to believers in Rome. So these people are saved. They're, they're Christians. But this inner transformation should now become outward actions to those around us. These outward actions are what set believers apart from the rest of the world. Listen, if we're believers, we should act differently than those people who don't know Christ. Amen? We should live differently than those who don't know Christ. This is shown by our acts of love, our acts of service, our acts of humility. Folks, 
When Christ lives in us, He shows through us to those around us. It should be obvious to others when we meet them that Christ is in us. So is that true of your life? Is that true of your life? Is it obvious to others that you know Christ? Well, it should be. Paul says, because of God's great mercy, He has already blessed these people with with salvation. So because of God's great mercy, because He has been so kind to us, let's present our bodies as a living sacrifice to Him. This is our true and proper spiritual act of worship. Just giving ourselves to God is an act of worship. We don't do this in order to be saved. We do this because we have been saved. Does that make sense? Because we're saved, we present our bodies to Him as a living sacrifice. Listen, uh, unbelievers come to Christ mostly for what they can get out of it. Does that make sense? They, they, want, to, they want to stay out of hell. And so they will come to Christ. They, they want forgiveness for their sin. So they come to Christ. They, they want to uh, gain eternal life. So they come to Christ. They want to put their shambled lives back together. So we come to Christ. We generally do it for what we can get out of it. I'm the same way. I got saved when I was five years old, but I was deathly afraid of hell. And I didn't want to go there. And so that's that's why I came to Christ. Christ. But now that Christ has come into our lives, we are capable of doing something that is unselfish. Before we came to Christ, it was very difficult for us to do that. But now that we know Jesus, we're capable of this unselfish act, this act of spiritual worship to Him. We offer ourselves to God not for what we can get out of it, but rather just as an an expression of pure love and devotion to God. Is that what your worship is all about? Or is your worship about trying to impress the people in the rows around you with with your singing or your spirituality or whatever it may be? Our worship should be just a pure expression of love and devotion to God. So... This living sacrifice that that Paul is referring to probably refers back to the the Old Testament sacrifices. In fact, during Paul's time, they were still going on. The whole burnt offering where the entire animal was given to God and sacrificed to Him and lit on fire and consumed in the fire on the altar. That's very likely what he's talking about. It was to be given completely to God and not shared with anyone else. Some of the sacrifices, the priests were able to get some of the meat and, and keep it, it to sustain them. Some, the, the family, some of the sacrifices, the family were, were to get some of the, the meat from the sacrifice. But the whole burnt offering was given completely to God. Every bit of it was sacrificed to Him And we need to give ourselves completely to God and solely to God as a living sacrifice. Now, I've said this here before. The trouble with living sacrifices is that they have a tendency to crawl off the altar. They have a tendency to to change their minds. And Paul is saying we need to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice, and never retract our our offer, never renege on our promise, never turn back on the commitment that we've made to God, but we need to give ourselves completely to Him. In fact, that is the only kind of sacrifice that God accepts. The only one that He accepts. And then He says that this sacrifice is to be holy. That means to be set apart from sin. Set apart from for a particular reason or a special purpose. 
So we are to be set apart to Him for a special purpose, for His special purpose. And it says that he is, it is to be pleasing to God. As believers, as I've already said, we ought to live differently than the, than the rest of the world. Our lives should make God smile. Have you ever thought about that? I, I've just kind of m- mulled on that uh, this week. Our lives should make God smile. When He looks down at you, and at your life, and the way you live, and the way you conduct your business, and the way you treat your family, and, and, and the way you lead your family, men. Does God smile? Does it bring a smile to His face, the way you live your life? Our goal should be to live as Jesus did. Loving, and forgiving, and serving and helping others, yet knowing when to speak the truth in love. Sometimes we have to do that. Sometimes we have to say and do hard things. Knowing when to share our faith. Is your life set apart for a special purpose for God? And is it pleasing to Him? I think it's interesting that many versions of Scripture say it like this. Present your bodies, plural, as a living sacrifice, singular. You ever thought of that? Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. I believe this is referring to the fact that we as a church should collectively present ourselves to God as one sacrifice. As one sacrifice. We should do this for the Lord. And it becomes evident as we read the rest of the chapter that this is probably what he's talking about. We together present our bodies as one sacrifice to God. There is nothing more beautiful to God than when His people are working together in harmony to bring glory and honor to Him. There is nothing more beautiful to him than to see that happening. That is the sacrifice that transforms us. And then he refers to the unity of the body, beginning in, chapter, uh, beginning in verse 4. For just as each, one, each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ, we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Now, the human body is made up of lots of parts. Lever 2000 says we have 2,000 parts, right? We have, but we just have one body. We have fingers and hands and toes and knees and elbows and armpits and All of those things, but just one body. Those are the parts that are seen. And then on the inside, we have lungs and tonsils. Well, most of us do, I suppose. We have a spleen, whatever that does, I I don't know. But we we have a heart, we have a brain. I have pictures of mine, so I have proof that I've got one. So... They were concerned about that, so they did x-rays. We have intestines, we have an appendix. All of these things work together to make us a body. One body, many parts. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 21, Paul says, The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you, and the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. What good would my feet be without the head telling them what to do? Nor, as Paul says in verse 15 of 1 Corinthians 12, that the foot would not cease to be a part of the body if it said, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body. That would be foolish. That would be foolish. The bottom line is this. In the body of Christ, we all need each other. We need each other, not only for the health of the body as a whole, but to enable each individual member 
to, to uh, operate to their full potential. We need each other. And it's true in the human body. Can I survive without a hand? Yes, I can. But not as well as if I had two good working hands, right? We've learned that. I've mentioned to you several times about Becky's thumb. She has had surgery on both of her thumbs and they don't work right. She can't bowl anymore. That's terrible. It's a, it's a, it's a sad thing. But she used to be a pretty good bowler. But, you know, it's even hard for her to button buttons and things like that at times because her, her thumbs don't work the way they used to because of injuries. So that's true in the human body, but it's also true in the church. We need each other. We belong to each other. We need unity in the body. But along with that unity in the body, there is room for diversity within the body. And again, in verse 4, And these members do not all have the same function. They don't all do the same thing. Some of the most complex machines ever built are the Ohio-class nuclear submarines that carry Trident nuclear warhead missiles. Each one is 560 feet long. The United States has 18 of these things. 42 feet wide and weighs over 18,750 tons. They're massive, but they are constantly on the move at about 30 miles an hour somewhere in the depths of the Earth's oceans. A Trident sub is composed of 700, over 750,000 individual parts. And these components are made all over the United States. From every corner of the country, they are pre-designed to fit into the whole plan of the submarine. And each piece has a unique part number on it, etched into it. And in fact, the critical machined pieces not only have that part number, but they have an employee identification number on it to where the U.S. government can trace it back to the very machinist who made that piece of equipment or made that particular part somewhere in the United States. The need for absolute integrity of performance and absolute interdependence on that piece or all of those pieces that work together is acutely clear in a submarine. Think about it. One small leak could cripple this 600-foot-long high-tech wonder when it is several hundred feet below the surface of the ocean. One small, tiny leak could cripple it. So all the parts are shipped in to the place where they build these, somewhere in Michigan, if I remember correctly. And then they are tested to make sure they are exactly to the spe- uh, made to the specifications that were given on the plans. And any parts that are not exactly to those specifications are thrown out and they have to start all over again. And that process is one of the reasons why these Trident subs are the most expensive objects ever built for their size. Bazillions of dollars. I, I've forgotten the number of what they cost, the, the uh, exact amount. But all the parts are shipped in and tested And they have to meet the specifications. You and I as members of the body of Christ are much like those myriads 
of parts that go into and components that go into that sub. No two of us are exactly alike. We are unique components in Christ's church. Wouldn't the, wouldn't the church be boring if everyone was just like me? <laughs> I know it would. I would be bored. Wouldn't it be boring if everyone was just like me? We are all vital and there is a function within the body that only we can perform. You can do things that I cannot do. Others can do things that we cannot do. We're vital to it. And we are signed by the very one who created us for his glory. His name is etched in our hearts. Every one of us. And we are also tested by him on site to be sure that we can accomplish the purpose that he has designed us to accomplish. Today I ask you, are you accomplishing God's purpose for your life? Are you accomplishing His purpose for your life? God's plan for each of us is that we be a living, walking dispenser of life the way He has called us to be. We go around this life giving life to others because He has given it to us. We have been built into Christ's body so we are to live and to walk and to live out the truth. That He has called us to live out. But we can only do that effectively if we are doing our part in the body of Christ. So are you doing your part in the body of Christ? So we see the unity in the body, we see the diversity within the body, and now we see the harmony of the body. Look at chapter, uh, verse 5. For uh, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. The Bible never describes the Christian life as being lived apart from other believers. It always has to do with the, the description of the Christian life always have to do with in the community, in the fellowship, in the body of Christ. Never any lone rangers that, he's, that Scripture talks about. All the members of the church universal are a part of the body of Christ. And we are to be actively and intimately involved in our local assemblies. The early church shared life as one body. And their goals and their desires were simple. They wanted to live a life of fellowship, of discipleship, of evangelism, of ministry and worship. Those were their goals. And all of us have been given the same spiritual duty as believers. We are to bring glory and honor to God and to stimulate each other or encourage each other in holiness and faithfulness to God. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25 say this. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but instead encouraging one another all the, and all the more as you see the day approaching. The basic meaning of the Greek word koinonia is fellowship. It's translated fellowship in Scripture many, many times. It has to do with communion or joint partnership or sharing together in partnership with each other. And when we received Jesus Christ, listen, we became partakers of the life in Him. And we became partakers and partners with all other believers. We need each other, folks. 
And we need to work together in harmony. Even though we are different, we are to serve God together in peace and harmony with each other. Not stirring up trouble, not stirring up tr- a strife. In fact, Scripture tells us that, that stirring up trouble within the church and causing dissension among the brethren is a sin from hell. 1 John chapter 1, verse 3. We proclaim to you that we have, what we have seen and heard, so that you, may, you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Christ Jesus. God wants us to fellowship with Him and fellowship with each other and work together and cooperate to be the church that He's called us to be. This partnership and this fellowship is permanent because we have eternal life. We have it now. We don't wait till we die to get eternal life. But when we get saved, we have eternal life. And so let's never lose the joy of our salvation by neglecting our duties as believers. But instead, let's use our lives to bring honor and glory to Christ and to build each other up. Folks, let's be the body of Christ. Let's be the body of Christ. Let's pray. We are many. God's great diversity. Yet Yet we we are are one one in Christ. Christ. Different faces, different races. Yet Yet we we are are one one in Christ. Christ. Butchers, bakers, website makers. Bankers, tailors, teachers, sailors. Yet Yet we we are are one one in in Christ. Christ. Fathers, mothers, sisters, brothers, single, married, broken, carried, yet Yet we we are are one in Christ. The happy, the clappy, the barely out of nappies, the ancient, the modern, the famous, the forgotten, yet Yet we we are are one in Christ. Christ. Some hopeful, some hopeless, some cope well, some cope less, some sure and some doubt. Some whisper, some shout, yet Yet we we are are one one in Christ. Those with abundance, those with need, those who are generous and wrestle with greed, yet Yet we we are are one in in Christ. Christ. Elbows, tummies, knees, and noses, kidneys, femurs, teeth, and toeses, some unmentionable, some protected, some accepted, some rejected, yet Yet we we are are one in Christ. Christ. A broken body, torn apart, mars God's image, breaks God's heart. And yet, for our Father knows how this will end, when all his kids will sing in harmony. The bride will dazzle, her branches bloom, so add your voice to him the tune, that That we are are one in in Christ. Let's be the body of Christ as we go about our days, as we go about our weeks, as we go about our lives. Let's do more than just have church, folks. Let's be the body of Christ. I encourage you to do that this week. God bless you. You're dismissed.